The title of my talk today is Numerical Methods and Computational Models for Applications in Neuroscience. <clears throat> and um, so, given the very background of the audience, it'll be um, part introduction to neuroscience, part introduction to the numerical and computational methods, and then towards the end, I'll show some applications using all these tools. Um, and as I'm in full screen mode, um, I think the best thing to do, would, if you have a question, feel free to unmute yourself and interrupt me anytime um, if you have a question on a particular slide, since I won't be observing any chat windows. Okay, so um, let me get started. First of all, I would like to um, mention the collaborations that made a lot of this work possible that I'm talking about today. So there, we, we typically collaborate with wet labs, so labs that can carry out experiments to validate any computational models we develop that can confirm any hypotheses coming from our mathematical simulations. So Mark Ellison um, and Andreas Vlachos are uh, people who provide uh, microscopy data on the geometries that we use. Um, they provide biochemical data on, let's say, calcium signals, et cetera. Then, of course, I want to point out my um, my colleagues back in Frankfurt and partially now in Saudi Arabia at KAUST, who um, who worked on many of the things I'll be talking about today. And um, on the right, you see a number of collaborators in Heidelberg, Munich, Germany, then the University of Minnesota, and then at my my home university, Temple, where I collaborate with with uh, colleagues in the math department, but also colleagues, for instance, Tina Butaro um, in the medical uh, college at Temple. So the work I'll be presenting today is partially funded by German funding agencies and also the NIH in the US. So I'll give you one motivational slide of what our work encompasses. One of the topics we are currently working on is transcranial magnetic stimulation. And transcranial magnetic stimulation is a technique that's been used in the clinical setting to treat, for instance, schizophrenia or depression in patients by taking a coil and holding it close to the skull, inducing a time-varying magnetic field, which then induces an electric field that um, goes through the skull into the brain and then activates parts of the brain electrically. So you have an electrical field from the outside applied to the brain. And the hope is that if you position your coil correctly and if you use a given protocol um, in your therapy, that this electric field stimulates the brain in such a way that it is advantageous in a clinical setting like schizophrenia. It's usually accompanied with pharmacological interventions, but the outline of, of this approach is you induce an electromagnetic field which activates cells at the network level Activation meaning a change in this quantity Vm, which is the membrane potential. And that electrical activity in networks and cells then downstream activates intracellular processes, most importantly, calcium inside cells. So um, we can think of this as a multi-scale model that couples the electromagnetic effects at the level of the whole brain which then interacts with smaller networks inside the brain electrically, and then also interacts with, with individual neurons at the level of biochemical signals such as calcium. Now, for such a very multi-scale approach, 
computational, we have to make sacrifices in the sense that if we um, if we move between the micro and macro scale, if you will, um, two techniques we employ is one uh, is dimension reduction. So can we condense a complicated three-dimensional process into lower dimensional models? And is there some sort of scale transfer we can make use of, for instance, homogenization approaches, et cetera? So this brings me first to the smallest scale I mentioned at the beginning, which is the cellular or even intracellular scale. For those who aren't necessarily familiar with brain cells, here is a rough sketch of what a brain cell looks like. So you have a cell body, the soma, from which tree-like structures grow in both spatial directions. You can think of this as a tree growing from a root. So you have branches growing from the cell body in one direction, and then you have the roots growing into the ground in the opposite direction. So the, the roots here we call the axon, which is a tree structure that propagates electrical signals to connected cells. So at some point you have crosstalk between two individual neurons, whereas the other tree structure, the dendrites, are typically thought of the receiving end of neurons. So you have receivers and you have signal transmitters, which would be the axon. So this is always thinking in terms of electrical activity of neurons. Electrical activity is generated at contact points between neurons, then propagated along these structures, which can be very complicated, and passed on to other neurons. Now, at the same time, this electrical activity will induce biochemical events in the cell. So if you look at this um, zoom in picture here, you see two cells are connected via so-called chemical synapses, where the electrical activity in the presynaptic cell will induce an event in the postsynaptic cell, so the receiving cell, and uh, this event typically involves calcium ions. And then you see inside the cell, there are a bunch of organelles such as mitochondria or the endoplasmic reticulum, which is a large calcium store. You see in the cell body, the soma, you see there's a nucleus that contains the DNA. The nucleus is surrounded by the endoplasmic reticulum, which can extend all the way up into these synaptic spines. And all of this intracellular architecture is critical in translating electrical signals into biochemical events, which then have a long lasting effect on neurons. They grow, they adapt, but if they're lacking the biochemical communication, from the dendrites to the nucleus where the DNA is stored, that is typically when cells begin to die. So cell death and cell survival is regulated at the intracellular scale. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> excuse me, the one thing I'd like to focus on in the beginning are these contact points between two cells. So, the classical idea of a synaptic spine is you have the dendrite from the dendrite again you can think of this as a tree growing buds and blossoming at the at the small branches so you have this budding effect where a spine grows with the given spine neck and then has a spine head that connects to neighboring cells the classical um, understanding of this biological unit is, well, I represent the spine head as some electrical circuit with a resistance and a resting potential. The membrane functions as a capacitor that can store charges. The spine neck, depending on its length, uh, functions as a resistor as well. And then the dendrite is another functional unit of this type. However, if you take a close look at these 
organelles and at these parts of neurons, you see that the three-dimensional architecture plays a critical role in neuronal signal processing. So it's not as easy as this picture here. Um, if we look at reality, you see these these spines. Now we see here the spine head and a spine, uh, the spine neck, excuse me, and the spine head um, of an actual 3D reconstruction of the spine. They're complex in shape. They contain intracellular organelles like the endoplasmic reticulum I mentioned earlier. You see this fine network structure embedded. These are actin filaments with which carry surface charges. And so you can imagine if ions enter this densely packed region uh, that is charged, it um, this this structure seems to regulate, fine tune regulate the movement of ions um, and a lot more fine grained as a typical electrical circuit model would allow you to do. So the question becomes how do we, how should we model biochemical signaling in these structures? How can we incorporate the detailed three-dimensional architecture of neurons and neuronal organelles to study the influence of geometry on biochemical signaling. So, oh, I'm just realizing all of my skipped slides appear here as well as I'm not in presenter mode. So I'll have to make sure to, to skip those, I apologize. Um, so the model at this ultrastructural level that we choose here is, are the three-dimensional Poisson Ernst Planck equations. So if you look at the schematics here on the right, you see that, um, we're, we're thinking of a piece of a dendrite now, which, which can be assumed to be some cylindrical structure. And if we look at the cross section, the membrane would be this omega sub m. And the membrane itself is defined by two interfaces, the interface on the interior gamma sub i and the interface in the exterior, which is gamma sub o, surrounded by an extracellular space omega sub o with boundary conditions that we'll need to impose on the exterior at some point as well. So with this idea in mind of the, the computational domain setup, we can look at the uh, Nernst-Planck equations, which basically tell you something about the temporal change of a concentration of a specific ion species I that is driven by a diffusive and an electric flux. And the electric flux which contains the gradient of the potential is coupled to a Poisson equation for the electric potential in this entire domain omega. Now the um, fluxes along the boundaries inner and outer then can be tabulated in such a way where we account for the diffusive and the electric flux again. So this is, from our perspective, sort of the most fine-grained continuum-based approach for describing um, ion movement in these domains. However, computationally, it would be extremely hard to represent a, an entire neuron or let alone a network of neurons at that level of detail. So you, as you saw from those spine images, the geometry is extremely complex, especially if you were to resolve the entire actin filament network. So it becomes infeasible to treat the entire problem in a 3D PMP approach. But what we can do is looking at dendrites and axons, which locally can be approximated by cylinders, we can assume local radial symmetry and condense our 3D PNP equations 
um, to a one-dimensional version of those equations. Now, if anyone in the audience has uh, heard of the Hodgkin-Huxley model and the cable equations, which is uh, the most classical computational models for electrical signal processing in neurons, the 1D PNP equations we can derive from the symmetry argument are actually equations that contain the classical Hodgkin-Huxley equations when neglecting the actual ion uh, movement in the equations. So this is actually um, sort of a superset of, of the Hodgkin-Huxley equations. Now we have a three-dimensional and a one-dimensional version of these P and P equations, but how do we couple these computationally? So um, we developed in our computational framework a way to couple higher dimensional domains with lower dimensional domains by introducing an extra layer of so-called constrained degrees of freedom, so we don't have to go into detail here. But this type of approach allows us to couple, let's say, a three-dimensional PNP region with a one-dimensional PNP region. So we can look at regions of interest in three-dimensional space, uh, for instance, studying synaptic spines, but then connecting in order to get the physical properties right, we can attach an entire neuron to such a domain in a one-dimensional setting. So with such a hybrid dimensional approach, we can now simulate the 3D dynamics. Again, I'm gonna skip this slide. Um, and study regions of interest in neurons, like in these two examples, I'm gonna play these videos. So you see, whoops, you see in this case, you have calcium entry at the synaptic spine um, is driven by a PNP model. We see the endoplasmic reticulum embedded here, same over here. And I'm gonna go into more detail later on these simulations. But as you can see, we can pick out a three-dimensional domain, reconstruct it, and then attach lower dimensional geometries, which you can't see in this particular video. So choosing the right model, of course, is, is a big question here. What, what are we trying to study? And um, what model should one be choosing? Sort of the simplest possible model, of course, being the guideline. Now I pointed out the P and P model in 3D, which forms the most detailed approach that we take, at least on the continuum scale. But there are other classical approaches, for instance, the 1D cable equation that I mentioned earlier. Um, so how are those models connected? Well, if we take the 3D P and P equations and we neglect the individual ion species and assume that diffusion is plays no critical role in whatever you're studying, neglecting these components leads you to a 3D version of the so-called cable equation. Now taking the 3D version of a cable equation, setting the extracellular potential to zero and assuming cable symmetry, we can turn these into a 1D form of the cable equations. On the other hand, as I mentioned before, if we set the extracellular potential to zero, assume cable symmetry, we can turn the PMP, 3D PMP model into a 1D PMP model. And again, neglecting ion species and fusion, the 1D PNP model delivers the 1D cable equation. So these are four types or four levels of detail, depending on the biological question that you can use, the cable equation being the, the classical version that, that came up in the 80s. Okay, so now as you saw, in the examples I gave, geometry is a very complicated thing in neurons. So we deal with very complex geometries. And from a computational standpoint, if we take these geometries coming from, let's say, 3D reconstruction from microscopy data, um, 
Typically, grid quality is such that numerical solvers have difficulty working with the computational grid coming from a 3D reconstruction. So computational grids need some pre-processing in the sense that um, element quality needs to be optimized. And of course, doing this manually would be very labor intensive. So we thought about ways to automate grid optimization. And one route that we took was um, using theory of smooth subdivision to optimize grids within our computational framework. So I'll go over this um, idea of smooth subdivision, in particular in the context of multigrid methods geometric multigrid methods before we look at some applications. Now, the computational grids, as I said, if you coming from some reconstruction method, typically contain elements that are unfavorable. So they contain um, potentially very obtuse angles, which then affect the convergence properties of a numerical solver. Now, if we think of geometric multigrid, which is a numerical solver that can have optimal um, convergence properties, but only the condition that the computational grid contains um, regular elements, so that in a multigrid strategy where you need to refine your grid or coarsen your grid iteratively to produce a grid hierarchy, errors in the coarse grid can propagate or then will, through linear subdivision, will worsen as you increase your level of refinement. And this is something you want to avoid. So, um, let me just skip a bit of this theory here. Um, so the subdiv subdivision methods are methods that originated in computer graphics where people were interested in taking a surface representation, a coarse surface representation of an object, usually for yeah, gaming, and uh, taking that coarse grid and refining it in such a way that you end up with a smooth surface. So if you're representing a face, you don't want it to contain edges and, and be edgy, but you want a smooth surface. And um, the technique of subdivision is you take the coarse grid and you apply a step of refinement, which is just linear bisection of your, of your element edges, but that is then followed by one step of vertex repositioning using a distinct position mask. So here you're not leaving the newly introduced vertices where they are on the bisected edge, but you basically solve a local minimization problem um, that minimizes the energy in the system and repositions the vertices accordingly. And this repositioning can be encoded in a subdivision matrix that takes care of the repositioning. So you end up with a hierarchy like this. Well, taking doing this for surfaces is well established. So one of the famous methods was introduced by Loop in 1987. Um, however, for 3D, which wasn't very interesting for computer graphics people because they were only interested in visualizing surfaces nicely, but for our case where we were doing three-dimensional computations, we need a regular volumetric grid as well. Um, the theory is not as well established. There is a paper by Schaefer et al. from 2004 that showed the convergence to a limit smooth surface or volume in this case can be proven if one subdivides tetrahedral elements into subtetrahedra and an octahedron at the center. So you end up with the mixed element grid 
uh, for which you can prove that your subdivision process will converge to limit volume. Now, we built on this approach in our method um, and used a mixed element volumetric grid refinement for geometric multigrid um, coupled to lower dimensional subdivision schemes to treat the boundary manifolds to automatically generate a regularized grid hierarchy for geometric multigrid um, in our computations. So <clears throat> here is an overview of the algorithm, which consists of a subdivision step. That's why we call it SGMG for subdivision-based geometric multigrid. Um, it contains a linear subdivision step. It contains the, well, average passes. We have to know something about the so-called vertex valence. Um, and then we uh, compute our grid hierarchy for this subdivision-based geometric multigrid approach for a mixed tetrahedral and octahedral mesh. This in and of itself can produce non-nested grid hierarchies and um, a lot of the, or many of the computational codes doing geometric multigrid work with nested grid hierarchies. So there is one pass of rejection of the, the coordinates back, back to the coarse grid and fine grid in order to ensure node nestedness. This is a tool, a technique we then implemented in our um, simulation framework UG4, which is a joint collaboration between um, the group of Professor Vitam in Frankfurt and in Kaus, Saudi Arabia, where we can then, or where we then tested this this smooth subdivision geometric multigrid method. So <clears throat> let me skip, whoops, here we go. So let's look at a few benchmark examples here. Um, one is we take a unit cube with the center vertex and we move it to the boundary closer and closer, uh, which induces elements that are very badly shaped um, speaking from a from a numerical solver perspective and we solve a model problem on it so basically a Poisson equation um, with geometric multigrid and um, and look at the results coming from the smooth subdivision hierarchy here we see a for this cell nucleus, this mixed tetrahedral octahedral mesh. Um, and let me skip these slides. Again, I'm not in presenter mode. That's why it's showing all of the slides I hide. Um, so here we see some examples of what we end up with. If we look at the uh, matrix condition of of our test cases. The uniform one with the central vertex in the center, we see that both geometric multigrid and SGMG behave very similarly as to be expected, but as the element quality decreases, the smooth subdivision approach then gives you an improvement factor that materializes in the well matrix condition but also when we look at solver iterations and solver runtime so if we look at solver iterations in geometric multigrid if we look at the worst case scenario we see that the subdivision based geometric multigrid method has up to 50 fold increased improvement and we see similar behavior for solver iterations, so uh, solver runtimes, excuse me. So if we look at the worst case scenario again, um, we get an improvement factor of around 40 in runtime compared to the standard geometric multigrid method. So this is very promising in the test case. Um, we applied this to the P and P equations and looked at two scenarios. We took uh, 
GMG, um, but we used adaptive grid refinement and we use subdivision geometric multigrid, but with global refinement, which would typically leave us with many more degrees of freedom than an adaptive refinement case. And um, as we see in column A, if we use standard adaptive geometric multigrid and look at the um, error in the gradients that we compute, um, we see that at, I should mention, this is a geometry where we took two spheres that we pushed together. So it makes this figure eight geometry. And at these re-entrant corners, you'd expect problems to arise numerically. And we see this here in these peaks in the rows one through four. And these are the ones we would like to get rid of computationally because these are errors. But even at level four refinement with three and a half million degrees of freedom, we still see these appearing. Whereas with global subdivision refinement, we see a reduction in that error. And as we can see, the outcome at refinement level three is already much better than what we see in level four for the standard approach. Whereas we're only using, even though we're using global refinement, less than a million degrees of freedom here compared to the three and a half. So this is not just in the um, um, benchmark case, but also in these real applications, a very useful tool. <clears throat> okay, so um, let me get to a few biological experiments. So let's get back to these synaptic spines I mentioned earlier. And um, what we see in microscopy data and reconstructions, the spines form a neck, a head, and they have an intracellular organelle sometimes present, which is the endoplasmic reticulum. And these shapes, as you can see in this time-lapse images, this shape changes over time. So you have a spine that may look like this, and at the end, it may look like this. And with that change in spine morphology, we see a change in the positioning of the endoplasmic reticulum as well in the sides. So what changes typically is the neck length, the spine head volume, and upon the structural changes, um, the intracellular architecture seems to adapt, and this is a hypothesis, in such a way to regain calcium homeostasis in the spine head. So even though things change, the cell is trying to keep the calcium signal reliable in the spine head, and also adapts in such a way to enable uh, calcium signaling between the spine head and the dendrite, which is critical to relay information to the cell nucleus. So one thing we did to study this, this question was we developed a, a tool to generate three-dimensional geometries of dendrite, spine head, spine neck, and um, uh, with different geometric parameters so we can crank out many, many geometries and we can solve a calcium model on these geometries. And the calcium model is driven by calcium entry at the synapses. There's binding of calcium to mobile buffers. And there is exchange of calcium across membranes. So one membrane is the plasma membrane surround defining the cell itself. So these are plasma membrane calcium pumps and sodium calcium exchangers. And then there are membranes that define the organelles inside, such as the endoplasmic reticulum, which is a large calcium store. So circa pumps can take calcium from the interior of the cell and pump it into the ER, but it can also pump calcium from the ER into the cell or the cytoplasm through channels like the ryanidine receptors and IP3 receptors. And these are the most critical parameters, these flux boundary conditions here. So we here we used a fairly simple diffusion reaction set of equations for cytosolic calcium, for a buffer B that interacts with calcium, 
Uh, we have a molecule called IP3 that is enzymatically produced and then interacts with this IP3 receptor and calcium to release calcium. And we have calcium in the ER that moves via diffusion. And then, like I said, the boundary conditions are the actual um, important ingredient um, that define all these channels and receptors. And these are established models for single channel and receptor um, for receptors and, and uh, pumps. We took this um, and translated this to uh, our continuum models in 3D. And I'm not going to go into detail what these what these models actually are, but um, this is this is published information. So we take this and incorporate this into our calcium model. So we end up with a diffusion reaction system with non-linear calcium dependent boundary conditions. And this is an example of what such a whoops simulation would look like. So you see calcium increase in the spine head and it propagates potentially into the dendrite and further on. In some cases, calcium only stays confined to the spine head. So we'll look at under which conditions do we see a stable communication between the spine head and the dendrite. And um, the first thing we did in this study was to take a spine and dendrite without an endoplasmic reticulum present in the spine itself. And we looked at calcium concentration in the head, the neck, and the dendrite. So as you see here, um, there is a signal in the head for all these cases where we have either no ER present, then we have an ER with a short length of what we call 0.5, a reference length 1.0, and then length 1.5. And for all of these geometries, we see a signal in the head, we see a reduced signal in the neck, but we see nothing in the dendrite, which is based on the fact that our endoplasmic reticulum was passive. So it's not exchanging calcium across its membrane. So it's a pure diffusion reaction system and the buffering is such that there is no active cal free calcium in the dendrite. So no matter what the geometric configuration is, with passive ER, there is no communication to the dendrites. However, if we now activate our ER in the sense that we add ryanidine receptors, which release calcium from the ER, we can study what happens if we introduce these receptors. So again, we're looking at the head, the neck, and the dendrite, these three regions. And well, now I see signal in the dendrite for at least some of the scenarios. And the two curves that show a signal in the dendrite are the ones belonging to these two geometries here. So where the endoplasmic reticulum is long enough to reach far enough into the spine it connects calcium entry here with the dendritic signal. So all of a sudden now with active ER, we do see a signal in the dendrite, but not for all geometries, for a subset of those. And we can repeat this for so-called IP3 receptors that have much smaller calcium release over time. So a slow release, but not as big as ryanidine receptor release. But then combining both, we see that the cell can induce so-called calcium reverberation. So there's an initial signal and then a delayed release from the ER that produces another signal. So with active ER, we see ryanidine coupling, uh, we see calcium coupling. So then we set out, among other things, to understand this idea of calcium homeostasis that neurobiologists talk about. And um, so what we did was we took a reference spine with an ER and a given spine head volume, and we look at the calcium dynamics in the head, neck, and dendrite again. So we have a head signal, we have a neck signal, and we have a dendrite signal that we can measure. But then we increase the spine head volume by a factor of two. And we observe that the original calcium signals in those three domains 
change radically and there is no communication to the dendrite due to the increased spine head volume. So then, of course, given that this is a computational model and we have this tool to generate all sorts of geometries, we can modify, for instance, the endoplasmic reticulum and see what happens if we grow this thing all the way into the spine head in the hope that it will reproduce the original signal. So we get there almost, as you see in panel D. It's not quite the same as the original signal, but we do get back our dendrite coupling we see here. Um, but we grew the ER as far as we could into the spine head and there's no way to go from there. So we said, well, what if we change the volume of the ER at the end and see how calcium responds then? In this panel E, we see that with that change, we can reproduce very accurately the original settings. So comparing the reference spine with a two times head size with an ER that grew into the spine head and then increased its volume at the end, we can ensure calcium homeostasis. After performing these simulations, um, we found a paper that had reconstructed this part of the ER in three dimensions. And these are these pictures here. So experimentally what people can show is that in fact this uh, this endoplasmic reticulum grows as one tubule into the spine head and then increases its surface area and volume at the end so this is exactly what uh, our model predicted would have to happen in order to ensure calcium homeostasis and here is a um, and here are 3d reconstructions that show that indeed um, neurons produce endoplasmic reticulum that look like this. So this was a nice confirmation to the computational work we had done previously. Okay, so let me check how many minutes do I have left for? Mm, I, for... I think uh, that was the 45th. So we have we're pretty much done is that it i i, I think uh, this is the case but okay. um if you if you have i mean if you want to invest a no, couple of minutes fine. as you want this is you fine. are free um maybe i'll just quickly mention that we're yeah. now extending this to human dendritic spines so mm -hmm. we're now using actual 3d reconstructions from human spines and studying the behavior of all these different spines um, in this context that I just mentioned. So we can perform um, simulations now on actual 3D reconstructed synaptic spines. And we see some interesting behavior. For instance, a single spike in calcium here all of a sudden induces this repetitive calcium release here. This is auto-generated just based on the geometry of the spine. There was one signal at the beginning and now this is self-induced by calcium exchange across the ER membrane, which is quite fascinating. And um, in closing the loop to the transcranial magnetic stimulation outline I gave at the very beginning, we can now extend this to the cellular level, couple this to the electrical activity of cells where we can simulate the electrical properties and the calcium properties simultaneously. And this is important for when we're coupling electric fields, the electric models with the calcium models. So this is currently, we recently submitted a paper on this. And finally, we can take this to larger networks where we can simulate large networks and then look at the calcium dynamics and in individual neurons that are reconstructed three-dimensionally um, in order to incorporate the endoplasmic reticulum and all the organelles that are relevant. And we see that electrical activity in the network then translates to calcium activity in individual neurons. So that closes the loop to transcranial magnetic stimulation and um,
what we're currently looking at is the coupling, which we've completed to a certain extent already between electric activity and uh, from TMS pulses to calcium dynamics. And now we want to systematically study calcium dynamics under different TMS protocols. So depending on where the coil is placed on your brain or on your skull and the frequency at which we stimulate, all of these things can now be studied in a systematic way. We can compare different cell types and species and one thing we're looking at is how far can we go on the network level? So currently we can deal with detailed reconstructions of about 100,000 neurons, um, but in a high performance computing setting, the grid import and export um, on high performance computing machines becomes a bottleneck which we're currently dealing with. Okay, and with that, I'd like to thank you and um, it was a pleasure being able to join your seminar and I'm happy to address any questions you may have.